Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel for part 3 of our Longitude tutorial series coming up on today's episode of 2020 Flight Simmers! Welcome back! In today's episode, we will be going over all of the pre-flight setup for the aircraft, like the weight and balances, the performance data in the G5000, as well as all of the autopilot setup for departure. We will then go over the takeoff process so I can show you how the VNAV works and all the quirks that come along with it during the ascent phase. We will also be using two add-ons during today's flight. One can be had inside of the marketplace labeled Longitude Enhancement Mod. The other one can be found over at flightsim.to. Links will be down below in the description for that. Make sure that you download the FDE Fix Mod. Once that is finished, go over to your livery section and double check that you're using the FDE Fix livery. Before we jump into the video today, I just have one disclaimer. I am not a pilot, so I will not be going over any of the procedures throughout the duration of this series. The aim of this series is to better help you have a better understanding of the systems and the avionics inside of the Longitude. If you have any comments or questions along the way, please post them down below in the comment section and I'll get right back to you. And if the video helps you out, be sure to hit that subscribe, tick on that little bell, and smash that thumbs up button. It is greatly appreciated. I did say this is part three of a four part series. If you haven't seen part one and two, links will also be down in the description. All right, so before we can spawn into our aircraft, there are several things that we need to take care of first in the world map. This is the only place where we're able to set our center of gravity for the aircraft. Now this is going to be very important when we are setting up our stability trim for takeoff. For today's flight, I will also be using SimBrief to calculate all of our weights and balances for us. Now I know many people use SimBrief, so that's why I decided to use this. And I want to show you how it can be a little bit confusing when you're trying to transfer the weight and balances over into Microsoft Flight Simulator. One thing to know about SimBrief when it calculates our weights is that it does not calculate our pilot and co-pilot weights. So that's not really going to be a big deal. I'll show you how we're going to work around that once we get into the aircraft. The first thing that I want to calculate is the payload and the cargo for the aircraft. So we're going to take 1,150 pounds and add that to 275 pounds. That gives us a grand total of 1,425 pounds. So we're going to take that number now and enter it into our payload section. I like using the global slider for the payload. The only caveat to this is that everything is going to be the same exact weight. But again, that's really not going to matter so much. And the other thing is, you're not going to be able to get the exact number you're looking for. So you just want to get it as close as possible. The next thing on the list is our block fuel for the aircraft. The block fuel for today's flight is going to be 4,526 pounds. So we just want to take that number now, and again, using the global slider, try to get it as close as possible. So now that we have all of our weights set up, we now need to go over to the center of gravity section or the balance section of the aircraft. What we're trying to achieve here is to get this little ball to be centered between our forward and our aft limits. We're going to use the slider above to make those slight corrections. Once you have it fairly centered between the two, you want to take notice of the center of gravity percentage at the very top. This is going to be the number that we need to be able to set our stability trim for takeoff. So in my case, I need to remember 32 degrees for when we get into the aircraft. It's a good idea at this point to jot this down on a piece of paper because I guarantee you, you'll most likely forget it. So now that we have completed the weight and balance section, I'm going to go ahead and spawn inside the aircraft and get it set up the way it was at the end of episode two. Welcome back. So before we jump into entering all of our performance data, there is a couple changes that I made to our flight plan. If we go down to our flight plan menu, you can see that we are now using the Vargas 4 departure. Everything else is pretty much the same. The other thing that I did was to help show you better how the VNAV works in the aircraft. 
is that I set a couple altitude restrictions for our departure as well. For Vargas, I set us at 8,000 feet, MTH at 25,000, and finally, once we get on the Q93 airway, I have our cruising altitude set here at 45,000 feet. Again, this is going to be very important so that the VNAV can calculate our descent for us. So now that I got that out of the way, let's hop into the performance data tab on the lower left hand corner of the control panel. So if we give that a left click, you'll see that we have several different menus that we can open up here. We're going to start with the takeoff data first. If we click on this, at the very top on the left hand side, these are all the different tabs that we can choose from. The very top tab will be the origin or our departure airport. This will automatically be set for us once we enter the flight plan into the G5000. The next tab down is the weather tab, and here is where we're going to calculate all of our weather for our departure. You do have the ability to go into each of these individually and change the readout. So for instance, if it's raining today, we can go in here and change it to wet. To load the wind and the temperature, that's pretty easy. All we need to do on the left hand side is click on the load METAR wind, and below that we can use the real air temperature, and that will populate every field for us. At the very bottom, we can click on show METAR data, and this is going to be very helpful for us setting our altimeters for our departure. So if we read down in the METAR data, we can see that our altimeter reading should be 2 niner, niner 7 for today's flight. At this point will be a good time for us to enter that data into our PFD. Now I am using custom weather today so we're going to leave it as is, but to change the barrel you would use the knob right above and we can just set to 2 niner, niner 7. Again, we're just going to leave it at 2 niner, niner 2. Once we have that done, we can hit the back button and we can head down to the runway tab on the left hand side. The runway tab will give us all the information about our departure runway. Now one good piece of information to take down from here is the runway heading of 217. Now would be a great time to set our heading bug on our HSI to the runway heading of 217. To change the heading, we're going to use the heading knob at the very top, and we will just change that until we get to 217. The next tab down on the left hand side is our takeoff configuration. Many of these items can be changed just by clicking on them and selecting your selection. There's a couple that cannot, I believe it's the anti-ice and the thrust reversers, but for today's flight we are going to use all the defaults that are here. So no need to make any changes, we can now hit the back button. The next menu over is our landing data. We're not going to go over this tab right now. We'll wait until we're in our cruise phase of our flight to go over the landing data. The speed bugs over on the right hand side, we're also going to wait to enter that information until we finish up with the weight and fuel. <laughs> so that leads us right down to the next menu, the weight and fuel section in the performance menu. The first tab that we have on the top is our operating weight. This will calculate the pilot and co pilot weights, as well as any storage or anything that we have in the cockpit. So to get this information, we are going to open up the Weight and Balance tab. Now for some reason, when I open up my Weight and Balance tab, it was giving me some weird undefined information here. And if that happens to you, you may have to go back in here and just use your global sliders again to try to get everything back to what your numbers should be saying. So what we need to do to calculate the pilot and co-pilot weights for today's flight is just add the 126 plus 126 together gives us 252 pounds. So we will enter 252 pounds here, hit enter, and that takes care of the operating weight for the aircraft. Next is the payload section. Now keep in mind that if we look at the payload here, we have eight passengers. Now remember what I said at the very beginning that SimBrief does not calculate pilot and co-pilot weights. We're going to enter all eight passengers that we have over here on the right hand side. And then we're going to enter those weights for the passengers of being 126 pounds. 
At the very bottom, below the passenger weight, we have cargo. So we just need to head down to the baggage section, and then we can add baggage 1 and baggage 2 together. That will also give us 252 pounds. Now one thing to take note of here is our zero fuel weight for the aircraft of being 24,901 pounds. Now let's go ahead and bring up the Simbrief flight plan again, and let's see how accurate that is. Over on the payload section, we can see the zero fuel weight should be 24,539 pounds. We are a little bit higher than we should be for our zero fuel weight. No, God! Ah, uh, but remember, we have the pilot and co-pilot weights added here. So let's go ahead and take away two passengers from the aircraft. And the reason why we did that is because we added a pilot and co-pilot, and Simbrief does not calculate a pilot and co-pilot. So I hope that makes sense. So now if we take a look at the zero fuel weight at 24,649 and 24,539, we are very, very close to our zero fuel weight figures. The next tab down on the left is our takeoff. This will enter the fuel that we have on board for the aircraft. This is very easy. All we need to do is hit the sink fuel on board and it will populate all the information that we need. Now, one thing to keep note of here is that these figures here are not going to match up 100% to what we have in our weight and balance. And the main reason for that is we're not setting each of these individually to get an exact number. So as long as we're close, I think we'll be just fine. The last tab down on the left is the landing tab. And this is where we can enter if we have any reserve fuels or if we want to set up extra holding times just in case there are any situations that may come about. If you want to change these, all you need to do is click on either box, enter your amount, and then hit enter. It's pretty much that easy. Now that we're done with the weight section, we can hit the back button, and we're going to head over to the speed bug section now. In the speed bug section, we have two tabs on the left hand side. We can choose either takeoff or landing tabs. For today, we're going to start off with takeoff, and then we can hit the all on to activate all of our takeoff V speeds. Uh, but there is one little caveat here. Microsoft Flight Simulator puts default values in here for us. So these are not the correct V speeds for the aircraft. To calculate your V speeds as well as your stability trim, I'll post a link down below in the description for this chart here on the right hand side. Now we're not going to be using this chart because of all these pop-ups that are on the screen. So I've done one better and took a zoom in shot for us. So let's take a look at the V-Speed section. At the very top of the chart, we have our weight in pounds for takeoff. Our takeoff weight today is right around 29,000 pounds, so that falls between the 28 and 32 here in the chart. We're just going to draw a line straight down, and that'll give us all the information we need for takeoff. So now let's go ahead and enter this information into our V-Speeds in the G5000. V1 was 109. V rotate is 112, and V2 is 124. All right, so now that we have those entered, let's say we set our stability trim for takeoff. Looking up at the MFD now, over here on the left hand side, you will see the trim or the stability trim slider. Currently, we're set at 00. zero. Over here on the right, above the V speeds, we'll have the stability trim chart. At the very top of this chart, we have the airplane center of gravity. Now this is that figure that I told you to write down when we were in the global map section setting up our weight and balance. On the left hand side gives the stability trim in minus degrees. So how this chart will work is you will go from the center of gravity at the top, so we'll start at 32, we'll draw a line straight down until it meets with our ascending line. From this point, if you draw a line straight to the left, That'll show you in degrees what you need to set your stability trim. And you can see we can also be in flaps 1 or flaps 2 configuration. But if you change the flaps 2, you also need to change that information in the takeoff configuration in the G5000. To adjust your stability trim, there's a rocker switch that will be on the yoke. Now, I'm using a Bravo throttle quadrant, so I can just use that to set my trim. All right, our trim is set for takeoff. We are now done with both of these charts.
Okay, so now we finished up with most of the important menus down here. We're just going to hit the back button to get back to the main menu. The next thing that we need to do is to make sure that our HSI is in FMS mode and not VOR1 or VOR2 mode. To set that up, we just need to come over to the PFD control panel and make sure that our nav source is set to FMS. Below the nav source, I also like to set up my bearing 1 for my nav 1, and that's going to be my ILS for my approach. All right, so now that we have the G5000 set up, let's go ahead and set up the autopilot for our departure. Now we have already set up the heading, and we have already adjusted the barrow. So what we're going to do now is turn on the flight director. I'm also going to activate heading hold, and we're also going to activate the VNAV. Now, if you watched episode one, I said that I didn't think VNAV worked in ascent, but it does work in ascent. It has a couple caveats to it as well. Unlike your approach into an airport, you have a vertical path. In your ascent phase, there is no vertical path. So if you turn on the VNAV, you also have to tell the aircraft how you want it to ascend to get to your first VNAV altitude. So for departure, I always like to use vertical speed. So we're going to press the vertical speed button and then set this for about 2,000 feet per minute. So now you may ask, why choose vertical speed on departure over flight level change? Well, most likely you're going to be using the auto throttle feature in the aircraft. And the other thing to know about the auto throttle is that the autopilot and the auto throttle are two separate systems. You can operate one and not the other. So if you are going to be using auto throttle, as you can see over here in magenta on the speed tape, our auto throttle is going to try to achieve a 200 knot speed. Flight level change will increase the pitch of the aircraft to try to maintain the speed that is in the ticker tape on the left hand side. The problem with that is when using auto throttle, it's going to full throttle it all the time. That's why I like to use vertical speed on our initial climb. Now that's also going to go into the next caveat of using VNAV on your ascent phase. If you're under 10,000 feet, the autopilot minimum speed is 250 knots. So let's say that you have a step climb of about 8,000 feet. Your aircraft will level off at 8,000 feet, but the VNAV in this aircraft will automatically switch to flight level change once you achieve your first altitude restriction. The aircraft is going to pitch up very high to try to keep our speed at 250 knots while at full throttle. The other thing that I did to help with that or to help mitigate that issue above 10,000 feet is I changed some of the default speeds in the VNAV section of the FMS, or the G5000. If we go over to the flight plan, down the VNAV, in this section we can change any of the speeds that we would like. For the climb section, if you highlight and click, I choose high speed climb. If you use maximum rate climb, you'll see that it is going to be 270, as well as the cruise climb will also be at 270. So what that's going to mean is if we're step climbing above 10,000 feet, it will automatically go into the cruise phase until we're ready to start ascending to the next step level. The cruise for the aircraft is automatically set at 320 knots. But what will happen here is once you start your next climb from your cruise speed, the climb will then try to pitch the aircraft up to achieve 270 knots. So what I like to do is just use the high speed climb and it puts us into a much more gradual climb. So I hope that helps you out with the VNAV climb profiles um, in the VNAV section. If you have any questions about this, please let me know down below in the comments section. All right, so the last thing that we need to set up in our autopilot section is going to be our cruising altitude. So over here on the right, we're just going to rotate the altitude knob until we get to 45,000 feet. So now I think we're just about ready to start up the aircraft and get the APU running. 
So let's head up top side, turn on some lights. And before I start up the APU, I do like to bring up the APU bleed page in the synoptics section. So we'll just half the screen. On the right hand side, we'll go to our aircraft systems, synoptics, and select aircraft bleed. This will allow us to know when we are able to start up the aircraft on the main engines. I'll show you what I'm talking about here in just a second. So to start up the APU, we're going to head down to the lower right hand corner of the console and turn our knob all the way to start. Now you'll notice that even though the APU comes up to 100%, that does not mean that we are ready to start our engines yet. We have to wait until the bleed valve on the APU opens to allow the air pressure to run through the system. All right, so now you can see the APU bleed valve is opened and we have this lit up in green, letting us know that we are ready to now start the engines. Starting the engines in this aircraft is pretty easy. All we need to do is to come down to the starter button, give that a press. We're going to look back up at the MFD, wait till we're about 15% on the N2. Go back down, flip up our cover, and press on the run button. Now you want to wait until this engine does spool up before we start engine number one. Alright, engine 2 is a go, so let's go ahead and get engine 1 fired up. We're going to just repeat that process. So before we taxi out, I did say in episode 1 that I would go over the hydraulics page in the synoptics menu. One thing you'll notice on the top right and left, we have a hydraulic system A and system B. We can shut those hydraulic systems down from the switches down below, and you'll see the hydraulic pressure is just going to fall off. Now one thing to note about the hydraulic system is, yes it functions on the screen, but it doesn't limit your functionality in the sim. So if you turn the hydraulic switches off, if we head outside, you can see we still have full functionality of all of the air surfaces. So what I wanted to show you was the PTCU and how it functions. We can use the PTCU to provide hydraulic power to either side of the aircraft Let's say we have an engine failure. We can use the PTCU to supplement the hydraulic power, so this way we won't lose any of our stabilizing surfaces while we're flying. But again, it really doesn't matter because it's not going to limit your functionality. Down on the bottom is a very important page. This is going to be the pre-flight page. Here this will give us some basic checks to check and make sure that we've done them. As you can see at the bottom here, we have not set our flaps. Now will be a good time to set our flaps down to our first notch. The only other check here is our parking brake, and I know that's on. The very last page is a summary page, and this will summarize all the systems for us on one page to give us a broad overview of how the system is functioning. At this point, there's no need to keep the APU running, so we can turn off the APU generator, and we're going to head back down and turn off the APU. We no longer need external power, so we can turn that off as well. Now there's one more thing that I want to go over with everyone before we take off. And that's because the takeoff process is going to go very quickly, and I won't be able to go over any of this once we get in the air. So if we take a look at the flight plan for today, you will notice that we're going to have a hard left out of the airport. So let's go over a scenario real quick that you may have an issue when you activate navigation hold. We take off from runway 22 using heading hold mode. Most likely, we're not going to start our turn until we're way over the ocean. So if we start our turn way out here, we don't want to try to circle back and get to this waypoint or the intercept waypoint. It's really not going to make any sense. 
And for that matter, if you activate navigation hold and you haven't actually completed a part of the leg, it's going to have you circling back around to try to get to the beginning of that leg to then complete that leg. And that's really not what we're looking for for the autopilot to do. Instead of having the autopilot try to get us to this waypoint, how about we have the autopilot try to get us on this leg of our route? This way, when we take off in heading hold mode, we don't have to make a very sharp left-hand turn to try to pick up that intercept waypoint. We can just intercept this part of the leg in general. So what I want to do is activate this section of the leg. How we're going to do that is go down to our flight plan. We're going to select the waypoint on that leg. And how we're going to know we have the correct waypoint is on the right hand side, you will see activate leg to waypoint. So we're going to be activating this leg to the Vargas waypoint. If we hit activate leg to waypoint, we'll see it's going to activate the intercept to Vargas. That's what we want, so let's hit OK. So now what you'll see on our flight plan is our flight plan's actually gonna start from the intercept point. So this way when we take off in heading hold mode and start our big wide left hand turn, now we can intercept that leg and our autopilot is not gonna spin us into circles to try to get to the leg prior to that. I hope that makes sense and if you have any questions on this, please let me know down below in the comments section. All right, now there is one more thing that I wanted to go over with everyone that I had a question about in episode number two, and that is the Mansec waypoint of our flight plan. I hope I pronounced that right. If I didn't, I'm sure somebody's gonna let me know down in the comments. What the Mansec is, is that's going to be a disconnect in our flight plan. And the autopilot will go into suspend mode until we tell it what we want it to do after that waypoint. So let's take a look at our flight plan real quick from the arrival to the approach. You can see that our MANSEC portion ends right here and at this point is where ATC would most likely start giving you vectors to line you up with your approach. Number 2081 Sierra, 4 miles on approach fix, turn right heading 030, maintain 2000 until established on the localized and cleared ILS runway 5 approach. 2000, there are three ways in which we can solve this issue. We can either delete the MANSEC waypoint, which I do not recommend. You can activate final once you get to the MANSEC waypoint so you can activate your approach. Or what I like to do is put the autopilot in the heading hold, activate my localizer one for my ILS, and then I would navigate out over the ocean and then start making my left hand turn to line myself up on final. At that point, I can activate the navigation hold and then I will pick up the localizer. If you have any comments about this, please let me know down below in the comments section. So I think we've burned enough fuel sitting here talking. Let's get taxied over to the runway and take off. All right, so before we hop on the runway, we're going to go ahead and turn on the landing lights. All right, everything looks good, so let's go ahead and activate the auto throttle. That button is found right on the side of the throttles down here. We're gonna click that, and you will also notice a TO that is gonna populate on your autopilot screen. Once we get to a certain altitude, I'm really not sure what that is, but the auto throttle will then take over and try to achieve what is highlighted in magenta above your speed ticker tape. All right, so let's go full throttle. Live, just about to rotate, rotate, gear up, we're going to
going to put us into autopilot mode now. All right, we're going to go ahead and start our turn to the left. Now, as you can see, we are way past the uh, initial turn that they wanted us to do. So that's why activating that part of the leg is going to be very helpful to prevent your plane from turning around on itself. We can now activate the nav mode. You will also see FMS populate in the autopilot panel, but it's going to be in white. So it's not active yet. It will not activate until we get close enough to the GPS course and then you will see the heading hold is going to drop off. FMS will light up in green and we will be on our way. Flaps are up. A little late on those. See, now you see how wide of a turn that we had to make to come out of our departure. Alright, so our aircraft speed has just increased to 250 knots. Now our first VNAV altitude has not populated yet, but as soon as we get a little bit closer, once we get on our intercept course here, then you will see the VNAV altitude or flight restriction populate right next to our cruising altitude. You will also see this information populate in the active flight plan panel at the bottom of the MFD if you have that activated. Now you can see that our 8,000 foot flight restriction has now populated into our VNAV. I'll bring everybody back once we get to the Vargas waypoint and I'll show you what happens to the VNAV once we level off at our step altitude. All right, so we are just about at 8,000 feet now, and if we look at the autopilot panel on the PFD, you will see that V-Alt-V has been highlighted in green. It now just turned to flight level change. So remember what I said at the beginning, that the VNAV is always going to revert to flight level change no matter where you set it initially. So now I wanna show you what's gonna happen once we start our next step climb and you'll see what I'm talking about when the aircraft just shoots up in the air. Now the only way to really mitigate this is if you turn off auto throttle and then manually control the throttles yourself or when you start your next phase of climb go back into vertical speed and you can set that. Alright so we are just about ready to pass the Vargas waypoint Take note of the VNAV altitude restriction, but pay closer attention to the vertical speed. There we go, automatically in flight level change, the plane pitches up, goes almost to full throttle, and we are over 7,000 feet per minute. That is crazy. But again, there's really nothing we can do about that other than controlling the throttles ourselves once we are in flight level change. Once we hit over 10,000 feet, we're now going to use the high speed climb phase, which is 300 knots. So as you see now, the plane is pitching down a little bit to achieve that 300 knots, and then it will again proceed to climb. On the autopilot panel, you'll see the V flight level change is highlighted in green and the 300 knot speed. Below that, we'll have the Alt V highlighted in white, and that's going to stop us at our next altitude restriction of 25,000 feet. Once we hit about 18,000 feet, you want to make sure that you turn into standard barometric pressure. Now, I'm already using a standard barrel pressure. But to get the standard barrel pressure, all we need to do is press in on the barrel knob 
and it will automatically turn us into standard barrow. Now keep in mind that you also have the ability to change your speed by clicking on the back portion of the speed knob and that will turn your magenta speed into a green and now you can adjust it yourself. But for today's flight we're going to leave everything in FMS mode so I can show you how the plane operates on its own. Alrighty folks, well that's going to finish us up for today's video. If you have any comments or questions, please post them down below in the comments section, and I'll get right back to you. If you haven't done so, make sure to hit that subscribe, tick on that little bell, and smash that thumbs up button. It is greatly appreciated. If you'd like to see part 4 of the series, click up here. If you haven't seen part 1 and 2, click down below in the description, links will be down there. To all my flight simmer friends around the world, keep the blue side up. And we will see you on the next one. Thanks for watching, everybody.